this is a joint presentation of EPU, Matrix Parent Network, and Parents Helping Parents. And Erica and I are from Matrix Parent Network, and Matrix has a mission of empowering families of children with special needs to successfully understand and access the systems that serve, up, serve them. So our goal here is to make you successful advocates. Um, it's not to advocate for you, but to make you feel really competent and effective as advocates uh, for your own children. And we need here to say that we are not attorneys. Um, we're not paid advocates. So that's not our role. Our role is to help you in your role. We need to tell you, this is go through this quickly, that we have these various federal and state designations. We're a federal parent training and information center, a California resource center for uh, just a few counties and a family empowerment center for just a few counties. But as a training and information center, we serve um, all of these counties that you can see on the screen up here. I'll get my pointer on all of these counties and um, EPU and uh, parents helping parents then serve a large section of California also. But wherever you are, um, even if you're not from one of our areas, most of this will apply. Uh, special ed law is pretty much the same throughout the state. So we also need to tell you that we got money from the federal government and the California Department of Education um, in order to do our work and present this to you. And um, we are very grateful for our federal and state grants, but if you care to donate, we would very much appreciate it. But again, uh, no requirement, this is a free workshop. Um, so this is what we hope you will know at the end of the presentation. And um, I just want to mention again at this point that you will get after this, um, in the next few days, you should get an email with a copy of this presentation. So you don't have to write down everything. And, and most of what we're going through is actually in your notice of procedural safeguards. So don't feel like you have to sit there and write down things. Um, you will get all of this information. Usually we send it out beforehand, but because of the way we've set the Zoom up, we have to send it out afterwards. So we want you to know what is the notice of procedural safeguards, how disputes are resolved, um, various different ways they're resolved, um, issues around school discipline and placement for students with disabilities, private school placement issues, and how to be more and more informed member of your child's IEP team. So, and this is part two of a two-part workshop. In the first workshop, we went through rights. That was the first part of the procedural safeguards. This is resolving disputes. So that's what we'll be focusing on is how you can resolve a dispute in special education. So we want to de demystify the notice of procedural safeguards. Um, as I've mentioned before, we'll be focusing on the second half of the procedural safeguards, the, the part that doesn't talk about what you're rights are before you get to a, a disagreement, but what your rights are if you have a disagreement and you're trying to resolve it. So first of all, you need to make sure that you have a copy of the procedural safeguards. And you probably have, if you've been to IEP meetings, if your child has been assessed, you probably have two or three or four copies of this because they tend to be handed out at every meeting that you have. This, the uh, Schools don't want to be held responsible for not having give you, given you this notice. But if for some reason you can't find it, if you didn't keep the copy you might have been given, you can always get a copy from the California Department of Education website. Again, this link is active when you get the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and it doesn't look exactly like this when you go to the website. It, it's set up as a web uh, searchable you know, click on the different sections. But if you print out a copy from uh, the CD website, that this is what you'll get. It looks just like what we're using. That's where we got the copy that we're using for this presentation. Um, and 
any version that you do receive should have identical language. So even if it's formatted differently, um, I know, I think Sonoma County formats theirs a little differently, but it's the same information. It should be exactly the same words, even if it looks a little bit different on the page. So what is the notice of procedural safeguards? First of all, it's an overview of your rights. It's information that you should get um, about your rights as parents of children from three through 21, um, or if they're 18, um, their rights. So this is, this is a notice of what your rights are. That's the purpose of it. And I think it might be worth saying at this point, when we've gone through this, trying to put together this presentation, we realize that the notice of procedural safeguards is, is not particularly written for, um, for understanding. It's, it's sort of obscure the way they go through these different parts. So it hops around a little bit and it's a little confusing, but it is worth going through and seeing where the information that describes your rights are. So when, when do you have to be given a copy? And the answer is just about any time. If you ask for a copy the first time your child is referred for an assessment, um, each time you're given an assessment plan uh, for evaluation of your child, um, upon receipt of the first state or due process complaint in a school year, and when the decision is made um, or removal that constitutes a change in placement. So anytime your, your student is uh, given a different placement, uh, you would have to be given a copy. But in fact, usually you get a copy at every IEP meeting. So now we're going to get to the heart of what we're focusing on today, um, how we resolve disputes. And of course, it's best to always use collaboration, creative problem solving, working together with your IEP team. We, you know, we hope re disputes are resolved easily through just meeting with your team and having an open discussion. That would be the best outcome. But just in case, you need to know that you do have the right to a due process hearing if nothing else works to resolve your disagreement. And even if you never have to utilize that right, it's important to know it's there. That will help you feel empowered. So before you get to the point of filing for due process, you should be thinking um, about what, what you should do at that point. And first of all, talking with your team, trying to figure out whether there's other ways that uh, your, your needs can be met or your child's needs can be met. Call for an IEP meeting. Um, and when you come to the meeting, be organized. Uh, think about if you were going to a due process hearing, what information would you want to bring? What information would you want to have at your fingertips? So be organized and prepared. Um, make the people in the school district and the school itself aware of your concerns. I mean, don't, don't sit and stew when you think the IEP isn't doing what you think it should be doing, or you don't think your child is getting the services that they need. Uh, make your concerns known, um, not, and not just verbally, put it in writing. It's always good to have a written record of whatever communications you have with the school about any disagreement that you have. Then you can ask the SELPA, and I hope everybody's familiar with what the SELPA is. SELPA stands for Special Education Local Plan Area. Um, and SELPAs are coordinating bodies that, that oversee and coordinate the, the uh, special eds in the area, the geographic area they serve. And the geographic area is often the county, but not always. It could be a different geographic region. But uh, the SELPA provides various services to special education programs in their area. And they um, usually have an alternative dispute resolution process that you can utilize. And this is a free service and is a good way to 
think about getting things taken care of before having to go to the step of, of due process. And then um, there's a procedural safeguards and referral service as a unit of the California Department of um, Education Special Ed Division. And they can answer a lot of questions. If you have a very specific question about how this actually works or what your rights exactly are, and you, you know, often we can help you, but, but this is sort of the, the final uh, authority on, on answering those questions. So if you need to, give them a call and they will try to help you resolve your question. Um, this uh, is a copy of The Edge, which is a newsletter on special education. And it's, uh, you'll get a copy of this again when you uh, get the, the follow-up email on this uh, presentation. And this you know, gives an overview of ways you can think about resolving disputes. So due process hearing. Um, on page seven of the procedural safeguards, if you have a copy and you're going through it, and we will show you that page in a second, um, due process is available when you've exhausted other avenues to resolve a conflict involving your child's special education, identification, assessment, placement, or FAPE. Uh, in those cases, you have the right to ask for an impartial due process hearing to resolve the conflict. And here is a picture of the page, page seven, where this is explained. And, uh, you know, script on, starting on page seven. And this is where it says, identification, assessment, educational placement, or the provision of faith. And um, the due process hearing must be filed, not held, but filed within two years from the date you knew or should have known about the alleged action. So that, that's when you may ask for a due process hearing. And the, the important limitations in that statement are that it's about educational rights, not technical violations. It's whether your child's educational rights uh, or you feel they have been violated. So this is not if, uh, if, if the IEP meeting is held 33 days after you've asked for it instead of 30 days. I mean, that's considered a technical violation. It's really if you really don't believe they're getting the services they need or they're not progressing as uh, you think they ought to be. And then you must file the request within two years from the date you knew or should have known about the action. And this is one of the reasons you should keep good records and keep all the correspondence uh, with the district. Because if, you're, if, the, if, if you say, I didn't know about this and the school can show that they have sent you notifications, that's not gonna bode well for you. So keep copies of all the notices you get and all the communications you've had back and forth with the school district. So, so you know what you should have known at a certain date. So now we're gonna talk about mediation and alternative dispute resolution because in the procedural safeguards, first they tell you you can have a due process hearing and then they talk about the fact that uh, there are alternative ways to resolve disputes. So the first question, uh, and again, this is this actually starts at the bottom of page six. Um, I think I said page seven before. This is uh, actually page six, I believe. Any case, we are now on page the bottom of very bottom of page six. Mediation and alternative dispute resolution. So after they tell you that you can have a due process hearing, um, they tell you what you can do before doing that if you want to now. These are voluntary. You don't have to use alternative dispute resolution or a local mediation session, but um, it's important to know that you can utilize these processes. So I talked about the self of providing alternative dispute resolution. So just be aware that that's something that you can ask for. And 
here in the procedural safeguards, it says a request for mediation or alternative dispute resolution may be made either before or after you request a due process hearing. And you can ask the local school district to resolve disputes through mediation or alternative dispute resolution. And these are less adversarial than a due process hearing. Um, they are voluntary, but the, the school can't force you to use those to delay your right to due process. That's the important thing to remember. And, and also this term mediation uh, gets very confusing in the procedural safeguards because there's different levels of mediation. There's local mediation, and that's what this is referring to. You're just asking the school district to, to mediate and get involved in the, in the decision um, rather than having a state representative involved. So alternative dispute resolution um, includes, uh, usually it means that there's a, a separate party that comes in either from the SELPA or someone independent that's hired by the SELPA to help uh, sort of mediate and, and result and come up with a solution that might be acceptable to both the district and the parents. Um, there's also such a thing as a facilitated IEP uh, that's available in some areas, not every area, but you can ask if you can have a facilitated IEP, which again is it's a neutral party coming in to help the meeting, the IEP meeting go smoothly and make sure that everybody's feeling heard. So if, if you think the problem is that the school district just isn't hearing you or not taking you seriously or not paying attention to what you're saying in meetings. Sometimes having a facilitated meeting is a way to just make sure that your thoughts are on the table and everybody's listening and responding to what you have to say. That's something that can be helpful and often is available. So there is a Center for Alternative Dispute Resolution. It's a national program. And uh, this link um, will take you there and they have a lot more information on the ADR process. And I'm not gonna go over this slide because it's just a bunch of links about uh, additional things that this uh, uh, dispute resolution organization provides. And you'll get these links when you get the, the PDF of this presentation. So um, now we get to the pre-hearing mediation conference. So what is the pre-hearing mediation conference? Um, this starts on the top of page seven. Um, what is the pre-hearing mediation conference? And, and it says that you may seek resolution through mediation prior to filing a request for a due process hearing conference is an informal proceeding conducted in a non-adversarial manner to resolve issues relating to identification assessment and educational placement of a child or to free appropriate public education. You know, when we first started throwing this term out, FAPE, um, at the beginning of this presentation, I didn't actually go over it. I hope all of you are familiar with this term, and if not, you need to become familiar with it. Um, as you may have heard in every uh, IEP, annual IEP meeting, there is an offer of FAPE made that's free, appropriate public education. And this is the, the, the goals, the services, the accommodations that are written down in the IEP that are supposed to make sure that your child can access the curriculum and make progress. Um, so become familiar with that term because it's an important term when you get to resolving disputes. The question is whether what the school district is providing actually constitutes free appropriate public education. So in any case, the, the pre-hearing mediation conference happens before due process, it's informal, and addresses the same issues that the due process hearing would. Um, the parents, the team members, and I think this is where it says here, at the pre-hearing conference, the parent 
or the school district may be accompanied and advised by non-attorney representatives. So you can't have an attorney at this pre-hearing mediation conference. You can consult with your attorney before or after the conference, but um, you can't have the attorneys in the meeting and neither you nor the school district can. However, um, you don't have to have this pre-hearing mediation conference. It's, an, it's a possibility, but not something you're required to do. But if this is a formal mediation conference. This is um, something where the state would be involved. You would have filed or have consulted the Office of Administrative Hearings and, and asked for uh, mediation or due process. You, all requests for pre-hearing mediation are filed with the superintendent and the party initiating the conference uh, has to file a written request and provide the other party with a copy of the request. It has to be scheduled within 15 days of receipt and uh, completed within 30 days unless both parties agree to extend the time. The resolution is reached, the parties execute a legally binding agreement that sets forth the, res the resolution and all discussions are confidential. Um, if, they're, if it doesn't resolve the issues, then you have the option of filing for a due process hearing. So there are all these uh, time requirements they, things have to proceed in a timely manner so that the school can't simply use this as a delaying tactic. Um, you, they have to proceed according to these time schedules. So if you come to a resolution within this pre-hearing mediation conference, you get a legally binding agreement. Uh, but if you don't resolve things, if you don't come to an agreement, then you can proceed to regular due process. So what are your due process rights? Um, this goes to the middle of page seven. And as we talk about this, I'm not sure we mentioned this uh, previously. All of this is handled when you get into due process. It's all handled by the California Office of Administrative Hearings. And they have a website and they have a special education division that has uh, a part of that website. And it's a very, very informative website. So if you're thinking about filing for due process, it's very important to visit that website and they will go through this process. Again, they'll give you all the, all the steps that you go through um, and give you some, some help understanding what you do at each step. But your due process rights are to have a fair hearing at the state level, so not local or county, but state, in front of a person who's knowledgeable about the law. Uh, you may have an attorney or an advocate with you. You can present evidence, confront, cross-examine, and require witnesses to be present. receive written or electronic verbatim record. So you can receive a record, written or recorded. You may have your child present at the hearing if you wish. It's not required, but if you want them to be there, they may be. And you can decide whether the hearing is open or closed to the public. If you don't want anybody else there, other than the parties involved, that's your choice. But if you want it to be open, uh, that's your choice also. And of course you get um, copies of all documents, uh, anything that uh, has to do with your child, any written record that the school or the school district have. And this is true of any documents at any time. Whenever you need copies of any documents concerning your child that are in their school record, you can request them and receive them within five business days. So 
due process rights continue. Um, now we're moving to page eight of the procedural safeguards handout and your rights continue. You can be told uh, what the other party's issues are and what their proposed resolution of the issues are. So what the school would propose to resolve your, your problem. Um, you have the right to have an interpreter provided if you need one to understand the hearing. And this is true if, you know, if one parent speaks English well and the other doesn't, you still have a right to have an interpreter so that everybody understands what's going on. You may request an extension of the timeline. The timeline is there to make sure there isn't delay in getting your dispute resolved. But if you need more time or your attorney asks for more time, you can have it. Um, and at any pr point in the pr due process hearing, you can say, you know, I think I would rather resolve this through mediation rather than have an, a hearing officer resolve it. I'd rather go back and try to mediate, uh, you know, try to come to a resolution through a mediation session. At any point, you can, you can go back and have that mediation. And then the other important thing is receive notice from the other party at least 10 days prior to the hearing that the other party intends to be represented by an attorney. I think you can more or less assume that the school district is going to be represented by an attorney. Um, but this means that you would have to, to notify them if you're bringing an attorney uh, to the procedure. So I think Erica is gonna take over for a few minutes here. Okay, so I'm starting with actually filing a written due process complaint. And we can just go to the next slide. So filing for due process and the document, where we are on the document, just to orient you again, or you can be looking at this on the website, or you can just be listening to us, but as it's arranged in these sort of question and answers, we are on the question, which is how do I request a due process hearing? And this would be potentially after you may have gone through these informal dispute resolution processes with the district, you're ready to take your disagreement to the next level, and this is how you would do it. So there are several different types of due process proceedings that you can actually request. Um, before filing for any of these, as we have mentioned, it's really useful to go to the website of the Special Education Division of the Office of Administrative Hearings. I was just on there the last few days preparing for this and found it really easy to navigate and to be a really good website. So I would really recommend it. Um, and we also understand that the people at this office will give you some amount of support as you undertake this, not sort of advice on whether you have a good case or not, but just the steps to take and maybe clarifying some of these terms that we've been trying to also clarify. And especially if you're trying to navigate this without an attorney. And if you have an attorney, that's probably going to make the process easier because they are probably, hopefully, quite a bit more familiar with it. Um, so here's the three ways you can file. There's mediation only, mediation and hearing, or hearing only. And the second two of these, the mediation and hearing and the hearing only, you, these can sometimes qualify for being expedited. Uh, that generally has to do with um, disciplinary situations. Um, what did I want to say? Oh, I was going to say that the most common is the mediation and hearing option. And so how do you actually file a complaint? This is under, again, under the heading, how do I request a due process hearing? And you can see here what you need to do. The things to pay attention to, first of all, it has to be written. Here are the things that you have to include. This would be either done by you, by your attorney or advocate. It has to include this list of things. And you can read through these, but have a look at number five, which says that you have to include a description of the nature of the problem, including facts related to the problem, 
and a proposed resolution to the problem. So this means what, uh, this means that you can't just say, there's a problem that you want to complain about. You have to include both what the issue is and what a potential solution is that you would find satisfactory. So what, if it's coming from the parent, what can the school do to solve the problem? And just below this, it also says that, um, that you have to provide a copy of this satisfactory solution to the other party, which would, if this is a parent, then that would be providing it to the school district. If the school district is filing, uh, then they have to provide to the parent what the satisfactory solution is. And this does happen in a few circumstances. Sometimes people don't think of this, uh, but for example, if a parent is continuing to not sign an IEP for a long time and the school doesn't want to agree to what the parent is asking for, then the school could be the one that takes the parent to due process. And we can go to the next, the next slide. So what is the resolution session? So here's another one of these different meetings with a different name that kind of seems to overlap with other things. So this particular thing is called a resolution session. And once you have filed the due process request, this is what happens next, a resolution session. This happens before, and before mediation, before a hearing. Basically what this goes back to is on the last slide, we went over the fact that you have to provide those specifics about what would be satisfactory to you, what would be a satisfactory outcome. This is the opportunity for the other party, which is likely the school district, to resolve the whole conflict by providing what you have specifically asked for or something very similar that you accept. This is sort of a, you have now specified what you want and it's a chance to avoid further expense and process for the other party to say, okay, I see clearly what you want here and uh, yes, we'll, we'll do it. The resolution session has to happen within 15 days of the request for the due process hearing. Probably calendar days, I think we're not sure on this, uh, an attorney would, would know. Um, and then here's some things about the resolution session. It includes a district representative. And interestingly, they can't bring a lawyer if you don't bring one. If you bring one, then they can bring one. And the resolution session can be waived if both parties agree in writing. So this would be if everybody clearly knows what it is that one side wants and that the other side isn't agreeing to it, it's already been gone over. Both sides say this is just gonna be a waste of time. We already know they both agree to waive it. Then it can be passed by. The next question jumps to on the next slide, does my child's placement change during the proceeding? Where does your child go to school during due process? You've filed for due process, perhaps what's going to happen with your child's placement or program during this? Does their placement change? Generally, no, their placement does not change. And this is, it does not call it stay put in the procedural safeguards, but this is what people refer to as stay put, that your child will stay where they are, their special day class, their general ed placement, their non-public school, while this is going on, unless you and the district agree to something else. So if the school district, for example, has proposed a change of placement that you don't agree with and you have filed for due process, they can't move your student into that new placement during due process. That's the stay put part of it. And I think that's all I have to say on this one. We can go to the next one. May the decision be appealed is the next question. Not with the Office of Administrative Hearing. The hearing officer's decision in the, um, in the, in the um, due process, the, hearing, the due process hearing officer, their decision is final and both parties are um, stuck with this decision. 
they both parties may be somewhat dissatisfied as the decision may not be exactly what either party was exactly asking for. But if you want to appeal this decision, then you or the district has to go to a state or federal court. Uh, that's um, not no longer within the Office of Administrative Hearing. And that this filing has to be within 90 days of the decision that was made by the hearing officer. That's how you do, you know, I mean, you do hear about these, these cases that go all the way through many courts, even up to the Supreme Court. That's how that kind of jump to the next level would happen. And who pays? So if you have an attorney or if you're thinking of having one, you might be thinking that that's going to be expensive. So who's going to pay the attorney's fees? It depends on who wins or who prevails, who's the prevailing party. If you are the prevailing party, if you're considered to be the, the side that won, the prevailing party, then your attorney's fees may be paid for or they may be somewhat paid for. If the district prevails or the other party, then you are probably paying all of your legal fees. And in any case, an advocate's fees will not be paid. And like Margaret said earlier, the Office of Administrative Hearing website does have a list of free and low cost attorneys um, that they maintain. So that is one option to look into. So attorney's fees, this uh, going on to the next slide, we're gonna talk about um, why the district may not be required to pay the total of the fees, even if you have prevailed. So there are still some reasons why they may not have to pay the whole bill. They can pay a reduced fee if it's found that you or your side caused unreasonable delays that you strung the case out unreasonably, they can pay less if the attorney's fees were unreasonable or they look at the average rate for your area. If the time was excessive, which is something that would be determined by the hearing officer. And then if your attorney didn't do things correctly, so didn't provide the information at the appropriate time to the appropriate people. But if it was the other side that caused the delays, then your fees would not, your attorney's fees would not be reduced. So if the other side caused the delays, you prevailed, that wouldn't be a reason to reduce the fees that are reimbursed to you. And I think on the next slide, there's a few more things that they won't pay for. So there will not be any fee reimbursement related to IEP team meetings that you may have brought an attorney to or had an attorney help prepare you for. This will generally not be included in the reimbursement, again, if you prevailed, unless the meeting is held directly related to the due process proceedings. And then finally, they may not pay or they may pay less if you rejected a reasonable settlement offer. offer and then the hearing decision that prevails in your case is not more favorable than what you rejected. So if the district said, we offer you X and Y, and you said no, and then the hearing officer said, the district has to provide X and Y, then they may not pay your attorney's fees. But in the same situation, if the hearing officer says, well, they have to provide X, Y, and Z, then this would be you know, one step more favorable and your fees may be covered. Um, so really all, a lot of this comes down to all, the, all this reimbursement of fees. A lot of it comes down to what was reasonable, what is considered reasonable. So that can be a good thing to kind of consider if you do go down this path as you're going, are you being reasonable? And is it apparent that you're being reasonable? And, and how can you make that apparent in the process? And then where do you file? Well, here's the contact information. It's also in your procedural safeguards packet. And 
let's see. Oh, I think I referred uh, when it says here on this slide mediation or due process, this is the state level mediation, not your local level mediation, such as through the district, the SELPA, uh, I mean, alternative, any kind of alternative dispute. This is the Office of Administrative Hearing, mediation or due process. So that is the end of that section. And now we're moving on to a section on discipline and placement. And our first question here, let's see, I think actually, we go to the next slide for the first question. Oh, uh, yes, so we're on, if you're using the, the California Department of Education version, we're about on page 10, but whatever version you're on, you can kind of look for these bold question and answers, or the, the questions are in bold and then the answers aren't. So we're on the, the bold question here, of, may my child be suspended or expelled? <laughs> I don't think I actually looked at that picture before, Margaret. <laughs> That's quite a little uh, graphic. Um, so may your child be suspended or expelled? And yes, under certain circumstances and decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. If the behavior results in, you know, if the school policies have been violated, then there are procedures that protect a, a student in special education from disciplinary responses up to a point, up to a point. If your child violates a code of student conduct, the district can do a few things. They can temporarily move your child to a different setting, an alternative education setting or other setting or suspend your child for not more than 10 consecutive school days. And they can do this, the move or suspend action for not more than 10 days for each incident. So it's still quite a lot that, that actually can happen. So what occurs after this 10 day removal? And I think this goes on to, yes, this goes onto this slide. If your child has been removed from their placement or suspended for more than 10 days during any one school year. So this is cumulative. So if there's been a, a three day and a three day and a three day and then another three day, that's getting you over the 10 days and within one school year. If that happens, the district has to do a few things. They have to offer services so that your child can continue to work to their, toward their IEP goals. If appropriate, the school can propose to evaluate your child with a functional behavioral assessment. And if appropriate, they may be offered behavioral intervention services and modifications to address the behavior. And there may be a behavior intervention plan called a BIP or a BIP or a positive behavior intervention plan. We have a couple of trainings all about this sort of situation, uh, functional behavioral assessments and behavioral intervention plans. So I won't go into them right now, but just know that those are terms and situations that might come up in this case. And then there's also a need to hold an IEP team meeting immediately or at least within 10 days of the removal or suspension. And this is a, an IEP meeting that is referred to as the manifestation determination meeting, which is, what, and what that means is, is the behavior will, what's called willful, and do they have control over it? Or is it a manifestation of their disability? Was it caused related to their disability? And since parents are part of the IEP team, you need to be included in this manifestation determination meeting. And this is quite an important meeting and quite an important distinction that has uh, consequences in how it can be responded to. If the IEP team determines that the behavior is a manifestation of the child's disability, so it is related to the disability, then the district can suggest these assessments 
uh, like I mentioned above, the functional behavioral assessment, perhaps a behavior intervention plan or a modification of one that already exists. The next question on the next slide and the next part here is, what happens if the IEP team determines that the misconduct is not caused by the disability? So if the team determines the behavior is not a manifestation of the disability, then the district can take disciplinary actions as if the student did not have a disability. So that's how you, you can see here that it's, yeah, that this is important. If you agree, if I'm sorry, if you disagree with this decision, so you would most likely disagree with the decision that the behavior was not related to the disability, then you can request an ex expedited due process hearing. And that's what I had mentioned just briefly earlier with the different kinds of due process that expedited is one of the, uh, it can apply to, I think it was the um, due process only or due process and mediation or hearing and mediation or just hearing only. And that has to then happen within 20 days of the date you requested the hearing. But no matter where your child ends up, what educational uh, location or placement or uh, situation, the district must always provide faith and continue your child's educational and related services. And like I said, we do have other trainings dedicated to behavior and um, behavior related to special education. So moving on to a new topic, now we're talking about children attending private school. And we're kind of gonna cover two different situations of children attending private school. One of them is if your child is attending a private school and the other is more if you think your child should be attending private school related to what kind of uh, services they're getting currently. So the first question under this section is, may students who are parentally placed in private school participate in publicly funded special education programs? So this question says parentally placed. This is talking about where parents have decided for whatever reason that they prefer to send their child to a private school. If this is a child that would be eligible for special education in public school, what happens in private school? So there are some funds that can be used to provide services for children that are at private schools, but it is not required that they have an offer of FAPE. They don't, or they're very unlikely um, that they would get everything that they would were they in public school. So an example of this would be uh, uh, for a, a child that maybe qualifies for speech therapy. If they were in public school, they would get um, speech therapy, you know, 30 minutes a week, every week of the school year. There's only a limited amount of funding for this for the student that's had their qualifies for this, but is at a private school. This funding may run out at any point, even in the middle of the school year. So that student in the private school may get their 30 minutes of speech. And then in January, the funding runs out, no more speech for that student and no responsibility that they have to be getting speech for the rest of the school year. Or another situation would be that the, a student that would be getting speech services and possibly occupational therapy too, were they in the public school, they'd maybe be getting both of those every week. Well, in the private school, uh, maybe the district is not providing occupational therapy for parentally placed private school students, they would only get speech. Those are just examples, but the idea is that FAPE, that free appropriate public education with all the services and support that are required to um, support the student to reach their goals, their IP goals, that's only required for public schools. Although it's good to know, I mean, some parents, people don't realize that there's any 
possibility of even getting any services when you're in, uh, if you have your kid in a private school. So it's good to know that, that there is a possibility of, of some support. So then the next, the, the next part here is talking about something different. This is um, the terms that are used here are the term that's used not in procedural safeguards, but to talk about this is unilateral placement. I don't know where that term comes from. It's not in the procedural safeguards, like I said, but it describes this different situation. This is where the special education student is in a public school. They have, an I, they have their IEP, but the parents are very unhappy with the public school situation. The parent decides to take the student out without this isn't a, an IEP placement the, you know, if the parent has suggested the placement, the district hasn't agreed, the parent says, this is really what needs to happen. I am going to take my kid out and place them in this private school and I want you, the district, to pay for it. So that's how this is different from the previous situation. In this case, the parent is saying, I wanna move them, I wanna put them in a private school. This is a better situation for them. And I actually think that you, the district, should pay for it. If the district has provided FAPE in the public school, they've provided that free appropriate public education, then they do not have to pay. So the question becomes, was the district providing FAPE? And if in the due process or court findings, it is decided that the school was not providing FAPE, then they would have to pay for this private school placement there's really this need to show that the school was not living up to FAPE. If you can prove this, then you may get that tuition paid for. However, as we'll see on the next slide, there are still some times that it can be reduced or denied. And let's see, I'm on, yeah, slide 44. So even if this is proven, you prove that the school wasn't providing FAPE and that uh, you were you know, sort of justified in making this unilateral placement, there's still times that that tuition can be reduced or denied. If you didn't make your child available for assessment before you removed them, and if you didn't provide the notice in a very certain specific way, uh, you needed to have provided notice to the school that you were going to do this at the most recent IEP meeting, and it says, or I believe, yes, this is the bottom part of the page. It says you need to either tell them at the IEP meeting or in writing to the district at least 10 business days, including holidays, before removing them. And um, you, might you, you might want to do both of these things just to make extra sure that you, you know, if you were in this situation, again, this would be a good time to have a lawyer if possible. Uh, to advise you on this, um, but you would probably want to let the school know at the IEP meeting that what they're offering doesn't satisfy you, and then notify them in writing as well. You wouldn't want to go through all this trouble and then be denied on a technicality of, of not doing the notice correctly. And and I think, yeah, yeah, we should make clear that this is this is not saying you're taking your child out of special education. Um, it's saying you're taking them out of being enrolled in the school or program that the, the IEP team has placed them in. So you're not rejecting the idea that your child needs special education. You're rejecting the particular placement that the IEP team has recommended. So we don't talk too much about this, but there's a little bit at the end of the procedural safeguards about state complaint procedures. This is a state compliance complaint, and this is different from pretty much everything. Most of what we've been talking about has been due process with the Office of Administrative Hearings. This is with filing a complaint with the California Department of Education. So if you believe that the district has not followed a state or federal law, you can file this written compliance complaint and you must do a few things. You have to specify at least one way that you believe the district didn't follow the rules. 
And examples of this are more related to what Margaret mentioned earlier called technical violations. So if the district didn't get back to you within the time period of when you requested an assessment or the district missed having your annual IEP completely, then you that would be an uh, appropriate place to consider filing a state compliance complaint. You do need to file this within a year of the violation and you have to send a copy of the complaint to the school district at the same time that you file the complaint with the Department of Education. So the, the, distinct, the, the distinction here is that for educational rights, you would go through the, the Office of Administrative Hearing Due Process for technical violations you would go through the California Department of Education compliance complaint. Although there's some overlap because a technical violation at a certain point might impact educational rights. And then another way to think about it, I think Margaret, you may have explained it to me this way actually, was that if it's something you want in the IEP that's not in the IEP, the, that's likely to be educational rights. If it's in the IEP or if it has to do with timelines and it's not done, then that would be more of a technical violation. Okay, and then finally, where do you file a state compliant complaint? This is in the procedural safeguards as well. Here's the information. Again, it's the California Department of Education in Sacramento. So um, we, so we've reached the end of the actual procedural safeguards document and we do have um, we have a few more slides that go over some uh, some tips on resolving disputes and collaboration and also advocacy. So these are some things we're supposed to remind you of every time we have a training. So I'll just run through these slides quickly. But um, and, and we pretty much went through this. The idea is that if you have a conflict, you should start at the lowest level possible and then work your way up. If you're just having a conflict with your child's teacher, you have a conference with the teacher. And then if that doesn't resolve your problem, you, you talk to the principal. If that doesn't work, you might talk to the school district representative, et cetera, until you, you, know, you go up the chain of command until you um, get the appropriate response. Um, and you try to do that before you have to go to more formal means of resolving disputes. And we pretty much covered that already. Um, and just a reminder that you can call Matrix or the parent center that serves your area and you know, have a discussion and strategize and think about how you might approach the problem, how you might approach an IEP meeting. Um, you've considered having a facilitated IEP meeting Perhaps you call the, the uh, SELPA to ask for alternative dispute re resolution. Maybe you've asked for a local informal mediation. And if necessary, you've gone to these more um, formal types of dispute resolving processes that are your right to do. Um, always remember, it's best to solve things through communication, collaboration, and cooperation. These are words to live by. It's best in all of the uh, situations you might find yourself in where there's a dis disagreement, but particularly um, in interactions with your IEP team. Uh, it's always important when you're talking to people at your school district or your school program that you Acknowledge and process your own emotions. You focus on your child's needs. Listen and ask questions, repeat, reflect, rephrase for clarification, build on small agreements, use humor, be appreciative, be respectful. And it's always important to assume that your IEP team is doing the best that they can, even if that doesn't seem to be sufficient to you they're there with the idea that they're trying to help your child. Um, and so even though you may disagree on how that is best done, uh, give them the benefit of the doubt in terms of their intentions. 
also, you know, um, you might want to be more involved in special education on behalf of not just your own child, but for all children with special needs. And, you know, this quote we like to put up, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So if you would like to get involved and find out more about what's new in special education, maybe see how you can help change the system for better locally or at a higher level. Um, consider joining your local selfless community advisory committee. Um, California Education Code requires that every SELPA have a community advisory committee for special education. The members can be both parents and professionals. And it's a collaborative partnership meant to improve and promote communication between schools, parents, and public agencies to increase community awareness, facilitate parent education, and support and coordinate activities on behalf of children with diverse needs. Um, so CACs are a function of the SELPA, not the school district. In some areas, not too many, but there are some areas where the SELPA and the school district are the exact same geographic area. Um, but usually the SELPA involves several school districts. Other ways you can be involved, um, you might find volunteer opportunities at school, in the classroom, the PTA. There might be a special ed PTA uh, in your area. You might want to attend school site council or school board meetings. Um, to advocate not just for your child, but all children with special needs. You can also look into the California Special Education Advisory Commission and the California State Department of Education Board if you're really into getting involved and being a leader on these issues. Another thing we'd like to mention, and this is very important, as, especially as your child gets older, older but it's, it's really never too soon to start. Um, the gift of self-advocacy. Can your child advocate for themselves? Um, it's important that people with special needs um, know what's best for themselves and express that to the people around them, the people that can help them provide accommodations or provide services. If you can have your child come to an IEP meeting and tell the IEP team what they need, it's a very powerful thing. Um, it's good training for your child, but it also often impresses the team much more than the parent asking for something. So if that's something your child can do, um, it's a good idea. It's a good idea to have them learn how to advocate for themselves. And especially as they get into being a young adult, uh, it becomes more and more important. And we have this list of resources that again, when you get the, um, PDF of this presentation, all of these links should be live and you should be able to, um, to find those or to direct your young adult to those uh, resources. And again, this is just the time to say this is a uh, presentation is co-sponsored by Parents Helping Parents, EPU Children's Center and Matrix Parent Network. Uh, and so you can contact any of these if you are in their geographic area. If you don't know what geographic area you are in, you can go to uh, the Parent Center Hub, www.parentcenterhub.org, and there's a Find Your Parent Center function on there, and it will tell you, um, based on which state and which county you live in, what parent center should be serving your needs. <clears throat> 